I'm Stephen Roy Goodman, host of Higher Education Today. Welcome back to the education program that connects you to contemporary issues, people, and institutions involved in the world of higher education. Today's show about Michigan State University neighborhoods is thanks to UDC-TV and WKAR-TV. Kelly High McCord and Reggie Noto are two neighborhood directors here at Michigan State University in East Lansing. Welcome to both of you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you for having us. Well, it's, it's a pleasure to be here, and thank you again for coming on the show. And Reggie, maybe if we could start with you. What are neighborhoods? What makes them so unusual? It's an interesting name. What, what are MSU neighborhoods? Well, they're a physical space, so they're a collection or a cluster of residence halls. But MSU has one of the largest residence hall systems in the United States. And so we've used the power of that residence hall system to leverage our graduation rates for all students. And has that been a problem at Michigan State? Um, I wouldn't say it's a problem. Um, MSU has a 78, I think, 70, this year, 78% graduation rate. Um, and compared to most four-year public universities, that's extraordinarily, um, extraordinarily good. But we do um, think we can do better. And Kelly, what are your take on the uh, on the neighborhoods? I would agree about using our robust system. I would also say organizationally, it gives us the opportunity to bring in resources into those residence hall spaces um, so that the units can work together differently and coordinate and collaborate to create a seamless experience to give our students the opportunity for academic success. Well, and speaking of that collaboration, so, so who are the people or what, in, what parts of institutions are coming together to create that student success? Um, we have um, the academic sides. So we have academic advisors. Um, we're trying to get faculty involved and increase our um, collaboration with faculty members. Um, we have healthcare providers. We have our residential college representatives, living learning program representatives, um, our community directors that are the live-in professionals in the hall. And so we come together as a team to talk about what's happening in our various units, our goals, what we're seeing with students um, in order to coordinate um, interventions for our students. Well, and speaking of the interventions, what are, if I can ask maybe both of you, what are the interventions that are typical interventions? Um, well, we have success teams in each neighborhood, which is uh, sort of a case management group, in, um, and it involves all of the professionals that Kelly was talking about. Um, and so each week, we meet together we use lots of data streams um, about our students, and then we um, decide what's the best customized intervention for a student that we may learn from various data points um, may be struggling with something. But how is that different from, let's say, a small liberal arts college that might say, well, we're a great liberal arts college and we're very small and that therefore we pay attention very carefully to what's going on in our student residence halls. Are you replicating what a small college is doing? In some ways we are, and that's what I was going to say. It's not that different. We do know that we have very um, good residential colleges, and so the neighborhoods is another way of providing a living, learning, high-impact um, experience for our students. But it must be expensive then, I'm assuming, as well, because you've got all these people who are now teaming up to make this, this experience uh, very hands-on. I imagine it is very expensive, but we also have extraordinary people that work at MSU. They're almost all willing to take on more because um, everybody really is involved in the academic mission. So would you have some advisors who are in the residence halls who are on one hand maybe helping students find resources for academics and then maybe on the other hand helping students find resources if they're having psychological issues? Absolutely. So our community directors attend our success team meetings um, and so they are building community and making connections and so we have to have close relationships with them because they see the students, they live there um, with the students in the building. Um, we capitalize on the student staff quite a bit so when we were talking about data sources we have the students providing us with information about their transition, how they're doing, if they are involved in any type of um, challenging situation so that we can customize the intervention to support them um, so they can be successful regardless of their um, transition to the MSU community. Well, that's interesting. You mentioned the challenging issues. So who is responsible for whom and whose fiduciary responsibility is to whom? 
So let's assume a student is having, a, a, a freshman or sophomore is having uh, difficulties with their roommate. Mm -hmm. So is the coach representing the university or representing the student? We, the student recognizes that they're an employee of the university and we train them very well so that they know their role and their responsibility and then when they need to refer to um, a full-time professional staff member. So um, we train them, you know, we don't train them specifically in mediation. We r rely on the resident assistants and our intercultural aides to do that. Um, but the coach could talk through, um, talk to the student and help them understand the resources that can help them manage that. They can be a list listening ear, right, and support them, and then also to keep them on track, to say, regardless of what's happening here, how can we still keep you on track academically? But what happens if they have to make a split-second decision? So something is happening right now, it's, it's midnight, and something bad is happening or about to happen, mm -hmm. and somebody has to make a very quick decision. What do you want the coaches to do in that, in that, in that instance? I think we would expect them to rely on their training. We choose them because we feel they have been successful. They've made um, good decisions while they're on campus. And again, we train the coaches to utilize the resources. So if there's a, a time when they need to rely on the residence hall staff, they will call upon them to do that. Um, and so, but I think they would coach the student to do the right thing and to utilize their resources. Well, if I can ask both of you this, because I, when I'm not hosting this show, I also am a student advisor, and I have a lot of students who make bad decisions sometimes in their lives. <laughs> yes. Not all the time, yes. but a lot yes. of times students make bad decisions. Yes. And other students have to either intervene or stop or help or do something. Mm -hmm. so, so how does this structure that you have here at Michigan State University prevent some of the really, really bad things that are happening at a lot of college campuses? Well, I think if you're talking about a split second decision that one of our coaches needs to make, they will call the police or they will rely on um, the residence hall staff to, who are very highly trained and know what to do. But I think what you're talking about is this peer-to-peer -peer model can be very powerful. And so our coaches are chosen to be um, success, you know, they're very successful students to start with, but um, they have a lot of training and they are influencers. They can um, definitely work with um, mostly a younger student and um, help them to make the right choices. Um, they also refer, refer, refer. They don't take on things that they can't handle. And to build on that, um, we want and expect our coaches to build relationships with their students. So hopefully that connection over time mm -hmm. will be caught before they have to get into that really critical situation um, that they've talked to talk them through it. Let's work this through while it's a smaller issue, not a larger issue. So the relationship building and the connections that they have hopefully will um, eliminate those situations if at all possible. Well, both, I think those are both fair points. Uh, in terms of the issue that you raised, Reggie, about the influencers, that's kind of an interesting point as well because obviously you want positive role modeling from kind of seniors mm -hmm. to juniors to, to, you know, all the way down to freshmen. How does your training make sure that that actually happens? Uh, well, part of it is in a fairly rigorous selection process. Um, we rely a lot on nominations from staff, so people have already worked with these students. Um, and then the, the training, we do suicide prevention training, we do FERPA training, we do, help me. Um, yes, <laughs> intercultural training, intercultural training, resource training, yes. Right. To prepare. I mean, it, it's three or four full days of training, so mm -hmm. quite a bit. And then in terms of the selection process, how are these students selected? Um, I, think, I think I'd let you answer more of that, but certainly we do look for students who have struggled themselves but are now very, very good students. Yes. So like Reggie said, we look for nominations. And so we know that our professional staff know those students, mm -hmm. right, and, and have seen them progress successfully um, while here at the university. Um, and so um, we have very rigorous interviews, and we ask them to share um, their experiences, how they've overcome things here at the university, how they what they did to be academically successful here at the university, um, but also their ability to connect and build relationships with the students that we're trying to reach here on campus. Well, what you just said in there was really interesting, I thought, was 
by bringing students who maybe struggled themselves a little bit. Mm -hmm. So do you find that students who had some struggles are more successful at helping other students who are struggling? That's our assumption um, that many times they are and we do ask them about that um, because they're able to reflect on their own experience um, and students have um, told us, our coach students have said, you know, it really helped that they were able to say, you know, I've been there, I've been where you are and this is how I overcame in this class mm -hmm. um, or this is how I managed my roommate situation um, and so I think they find comfort in that, um, that someone is able to relate and they can see a success story right in front of them. Well, we hear that from a lot of teachers that some of the most successful teachers tend to be the ones that struggled with a particular subject mm -hmm. because they may have some more empathy for the yeah. students who are struggling with that particular subject. Yes. Yes, absolutely. And so we see that in the relationship building as well. And so they're seeing them overcome and be successful. And so that's exactly what we want for our students. Well, fair enough. We only have a few minutes left before we're going to, I think we should tell uh, our viewers that we're going to have some students who are actually student uh, coaches here at Michigan State University who are going to be coming on in a moment. But is there anything else that either of you wanted to say about the initiative per se and why other universities around the United States or perhaps around the world might want to think about adopting some of this? I think that we're trying to become a national model for a very large institution um, taking on some smaller liberal arts college um, characteristics and caring for our students. So our students have this smaller community where they know resources are available, they're connecting with um, their peers in the places where they live, and we're coordinating. So they're not just a number at this very large Research One institution. And so they have this small community but still can take advantage of all that we have to offer at MSU. And so I think to your question, um, the organizational changes that have happened are some of the things I think that we would like other universities to understand. It's that, yes, there's a physical space that we're trying to make smaller for students, but that it's also, as our provost said, that student success is everyone's job, mm -hmm. and that that is the primary reason that we come to work every day. And so um, working across many different units, recognizing other units' expertise and how that can be a part of each student's success is, I think, um, what Absolutely. we are also creating in addition to this um, student view of student success. Thank you both for uh, coming on the show today. Um, and as I mentioned a moment ago, we're going to be chatting in a moment with two current seniors about their firsthand experiences here at Michigan State University and specifically with the MSU neighborhoods. We're back with Autumn C. Johnson and Rachel D. King, who are both coaches here in the MSU neighborhoods. Welcome to both of you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Autumn, maybe if we can start with you. Uh, what are the coaches and why did you become a coach and what does it mean to your daily life? Well, coaches are essentially uh, mentors for first year students. They pretty much aid in the transition from high school to college because as we know that can be a rocky transition and we like to focus on their social engagement and also helping them with academics. And you experienced this transition yourself and now you're advising other students through that. That is correct. So my first year transition, it was a little rocky. It's hard to find your niche at a big university, but being at this school, I've been able to find my niche through the neighborhoods, and I just wanted to provide that for other students. And Rachel, how about you? Was there a, tra a difficult transition for you as well? I was actually a transfer student from a community college, so I was more on the track with academics, but I had no idea what it was like to be on a university and a part of a big community like that. So the institutional navigation and socio-emotional engagement factors were like not so hot for me. And then as a coach, I was able to broaden my horizons and help students who were transitioning academically. And then we together were transitioning in terms of institutional navigation and the social-emotional engagement. Because it's important to be a student coach because students were going through the same things they are every day just at a different time frame. So we have a little bit more um, wisdom, I guess you could say, with how the university works, and it's very meaningful to be able to help them out in that way. Well, I imagine that is so, and it, but particularly for, for students who are transferring here from other schools, are there a lot of transfer students here? 
We do have a pretty significant amount of transfer students here, and it might seem like there's not as much for them, but the neighborhood centers are definitely there for them, and it's, it's nice to be able to help them realize that. Well, and speaking of the kind of niche communities, I think you raised the issue of the niche communities. In terms of the niche communities, there must be lots of niche communities here at Michigan State University, which is a very large place. There must mm -hmm. be students who are veterans, students who went to community colleges, students who perhaps struggled in high school, students perhaps who are athletes. Do you counsel them or coach them in different ways? I think everyone has a particular way that they need to be coached. Everyone's different, and that's something that we really have to take into consideration. So some people may be introverts, and maybe they don't want to join a million clubs. But other people, maybe they want to get out and venture out more. So that definitely factors into our coaching styles. And you don't seem like you're an introvert at all. No, I'm not. <laughs> so, so how do you coach introverts? Well, for me, um, it's really important for me to understand what they want from me and how I can best assist them. So, for instance, maybe they just want a quiet place to study. I can definitely provide that because I've had many years on campus and I know all the great study spots. So, things like that can definitely be beneficial for them. And what about you, Rachel? Do you have, are there, do you, are there different communities of, of, of people who you're counseling or coaching who you coach in a different way? Um, for the most part, when we get our scholars, they're kind of geared around our major, so there's a little bit of similarities, but they're still, like Autumn said, like some are introverts, some are extroverts, some are interested in athletics, and others are interested in other things like game nights or whatnot. So we try to offer as much as we can. Like, my favorite thing to do is put on events like that, switch it up a little bit. My favorite one is called Comfort Food Night, where students they, our students come from a variety of backgrounds, so we'll take turns with each student, have them pick a favorite dish from home, and we'll make it together and share it together, and it helps them bring home to campus and kind of create a community that's very, you know, accepting of every culture that we have. That's a really interesting idea. Do the dining halls have anything to do with that? Um, well, the dining, dining halls do attempt very much to try and reach as far out culturally as they can, but it's just a little different when you're with them, making it with them, just kind of as if their parents would have made it with them or they would have made it with their siblings. So having that genuine relationship and you know, us time of just hanging out, putting the books down for a second, and just making a meal together is just very homey. That's a really interesting point. What about students who are a little older, uh, students who perhaps aren't traditionally aged students? Are they in the residence halls generally or not here? There are different ages of students coming in. I know that um, one of my friends who's an RA is, uh, I think, 26 and is still in the dorms. So, I mean, we do have a variety of ages. And you find that as well, Autumn? Definitely. So, actually, I still live in the residence halls as well, and I'm 21. So, it's just a great place to be. But everyone has a different preference. So, there are great off-campus housing as well as on-campus housing. Well, and speaking of the housing, is do you find that it's helpful to have students spend more time in the residence halls or students perhaps who were off campus and then came back to the residence halls? Um, I think that again goes back to preference. So like for me, I like to be around the residence halls because that's where all my resources are and I've made a lot of genuine relationships there. But as for others, maybe they would like to live off campus, but then they can still come back and still attain all of those resources that on-campus students still have. Yes, the off-campus students have their own engagement center, the North Engagement Center, where um, because the neighborhoods are kind of set up for those living spaces, but the North also has the off-campus. Um, that's their home base. So if they choose to live off campus, they can definitely still make use of all the, res the resources on campus. Um, either way, it's their choice. Now what about, uh, what about issues that are difficult issues that happen really late at night? We've had a lot of problems around the United States, and I don't mean to put you both on the spot, but we've had a lot of problems around the United States with crazy things that have happened in residence halls really late at night. What happens when you're confronted with a situation and you've got to make a split second decision? How do you, what goes on in your mind and, and, and how are you marshalling the resources that you have? So what I do, um, the RA is really in charge of um, helping out with those kinds of things in the residence halls because we might not be in their halls with them. So if they call me, 
I ask them to immediately call the RA on duty. There's posters all along the walls that have that number right there for them to call the RA on duty and, if necessary, to call 911. What are some of the things that you've had to deal with uh, in terms of when you've been on duty, as it were? Well, as our role, we aren't specifically on duty. Um, that would be more of a resident assistant role. But say when we are with a scholar and they have a problem, we try to answer them to the best of our ability. And if there's something that we know that we aren't capable of handling, we would report up to our supervisor so that they can get the best help possible. So what would be an example of something that you dealt with uh, last this year or last year without mentioning somebody's name or something confidential, but <laughs> what, are, what, what are some issues that, that keep coming up? Can you think of a common issue? Really, the biggest <laughs> emergencies that we usually handle are um, oh my goodness, Rachel, I have an exam tomorrow and I haven't studied. <laughs> so we don't really deal with, um, it's mostly like academic emergencies that we handle. Um, so we try to help calm them down and um, maybe ask them to pull out their notes and we can give them a study plan, you know. We're really good with, like, that's one of our key features as coaches is we help them with study skills because that tends to be a hard thing for high school students to transition into college because mm -hmm. in high school you don't have to study as much. But um, in terms of other emergencies, I did, I think I did have one where a student was really missing home and they were having some roommate issues because they were trying to call home because there was a, a so many hour difference, perhaps 12 hour difference, and the roommate was saying, I'm trying to sleep. So I had to help um, ask them to talk to their RA about it, maybe have an official agreement on paper about you know what, what times this person can call their parents and maybe somebody else could um, maybe they can sometimes go to their friend's dorm if their friend is up, you know, they can call their parents from there, you know, just trying to problem solve and compromise. Well, in terms of the academic emergency that you referenced a second ago, uh, why is there not uh, a, an academic emergency unit, as it were, within the, the department? Let's say you're interested in biology or you're interested in chemistry, isn't there a chemistry support center or a biology support center? There definitely is. We have, um, like say, chemistry tutors, biology mm -hmm. tutors, but they're not late at night so much. They do have them um, a lot of times throughout the day on weekends. There's multiple places, like there's their home base that they usually have it, like the chemistry, it's the chem building. Um, and for other resources, we also have tutors in the neighborhoods but we get those late night calls because they're not quite used to having those resources right there. So we have to also help them time manage and be like, there's a resource right here for you. Let's look at the hours and let's pick a time in your schedule where you can go so that you're not freaking out this late at night when you should be sleeping. <laughs> well, but I imagine that must happen quite a bit. It does. Um, it's really part of the college experience of trying to get used to the study schedule and we help them as best as they can with, you know, because not everyone is going to be the same exact way, but we still try to encourage them to reach out, to email professors, go to their office hours, um, go to the chemistry tutors and other, um, say the math learning center, um, to help them as best as they can and help them also time manage as they transition that way. Well, if I can ask you one uh, last question, which is the issue of how you deal with people who are just a little bit younger than you are. So you're acting as a peer, but you're also acting as an advisor as well. I actually think that's the best way to have a mentor relationship because I know for me, if I'm talking to my parent, I may react differently when they tell me to do something than if I'm talking to a friend. So I think having this peer advisor relationship is awesome because they know, hey, they just went through it maybe less than a year ago. So I definitely can depend on them to give me accurate information and I'm going to be benefit from it well. Definitely. I definitely agree with you, Autumn. Um, it is very meaningful to me because they just, they, there seems to be some level of sameness because we're both dealing with this, we're really in this together. So they might be more inclined to say like, I failed that test and I don't want to tell anybody about it, but I have no idea what I'm going to do. Am I going to fail this class? What do I have to do? And um, having that ability to just be, then be able to say that is very meaningful as a mentor because now we know what we can do. We can help them you know, plan, make a plan, you know, studying plan and whatnot and meet with their professor and we can go from there. But if there's not that level of trust, it's really hard to really help them in the way that they need. And what about if we can move to the social? How are you advising students who are perhaps going through difficult social issues?
we have comfort food nights and we have study tables so we try to have them in their neighborhoods as much as possible so that say if we have an event going on we can just go up to the room and be like hey want to come down like how have you been let's go hang out for a little bit just to give them a little nudge if they might be a little shy or whatnot to try and you know break out of that comfort zone a little bit and meet some people make some connections it's kind of hard to find your good social group so i think as our role, it's important to encourage, okay, let's go to a club meeting tonight. I'll go with you. You'll feel more comfortable. Or let's get a group of people together to study. So having that social aspect is just so important, and that's a big part of our role. We have a few seconds left. Anything you want to say to potential future Michigan State University students? If you are identified as a scholar at Michigan State, you'll be given many emails about it. And I suggest that you really take that seriously because we're here for you. And if you're not considered a scholar, you can always join. You just um, follow the emails and the advertisements that are going to be posted out everywhere. And like we said, we're really here for you on a level that um, other mentors might not be able to because we're going through whatever you're going through right now. Or we have other connections with other coaches that we can just talk to like, hey, you just went through this and I have a student that's going through this. Let's get through this together. Definitely. Peer mentoring is so important. So if you have someone who could be a peer mentor for you, definitely take that opportunity. Thank you, Autumn and Rachel. And thank you all for watching another edition of Higher Education Today. If you would like additional information about the Michigan State University neighborhoods, please visit liveon.msu.edu slash neighborhoods. If you have comments or suggestions about Higher Education Today, please send an email to our viewer mailbox at Today at topcolleges.com. And thank you for watching. We will continue to bring you quality discussions about important matters in today's college and university world. Please join me again for another edition of Higher Education Today. I'm Stephen Roy Goodman, and you've been watching Higher Education Today. <music>